Thank you for joining us, everyone, at Skype a Scientist Live. We're going to be talking all about dinosaur diseases today, which is like so weird and so cool, and I'm really excited about it. So, um, for anybody who doesn't know, Skype a Scientist is a nonprofit, and we connect scientists with everybody humanly possible all around the world. Um, and so, if you can support us, uh, all of these live streams are donor supported. So, you can go to patreon.com/slash Skype a Scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a scientist. Um, I think that's all the news for today. Today's Tuesday. And tomorrow, therefore, is Wednesday. And tomorrow, we're going to be having four live streams in one day um, because we've teamed up with Earth Day Network. Um, they are another group that really focuses on uh, generally um, environmental friendly advocacy and they're a really awesome group and so we're going to be talking about plastic pollution biodiversity climate change and then kind of a overview of earth day uh in general and so uh you can check out our website for all the schedule there it's gonna be super cool so with that um thank you yara for joining us today uh do you want to introduce yourself and maybe give us a little overview of what you do and why you like it sure uh, hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited to talk about this. Uh, so I'm Yara Haridi. I'm a PhD student in Berlin right now. I'm studying um, basically bone evolution. Uh, but that's not what we're, we're really going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, paleopathologies. So that includes dinosaur diseases as has been advertised. Uh, but what paleopathology in general is, um, it's basically the study of ancient diseases. And that includes everything from Neanderthals, late humans, um, all the way to our earliest ancestors, um, and basically what diseases they could and could not get, and what it means for biology as a whole. So it's basically a really, really broad um, ology, if you will. But it's basically the study of ancient diseases. And it's kind of a tangent from my own research, which is the evolution of bone, but it's not completely unrelated because um, diseases and how bones heal and how they function actually are incredibly related, especially when it comes to fossils. Because if you think about it, um, the only way we can figure out how something works is when it breaks. So that's kind of why I really like to study um, basically bone breaks in big animals, uh, infections, all that kind of stuff, because you can compare it to modern animals and then you can figure out kind of how bone works. Awesome. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple questions already. Um, so Kai, age six, would like to know um, what kind of diseases are there? Or what kind of like, just generally, what do you like encounter that you see problems uh, in the bones? So hi, Kai. Uh, the most common thing that we get to see is breaks, basically. So if you've ever broken your arm, if you've ever fallen off your bike, and you've had to get a cast, uh, basically, that's the most common kind of break, usually a fracture, just slight fractures, um, anything that has a sign of healing. And that's because those are the things that are most survivable. So you can basically survive a break and keep going on with your life and then die and become a fossil, and it's fine. Um, also, the really big indicators for behavior. So if you're thinking about dinosaurs, um, think if you're a big, heavy animal and you're falling or you're fighting or you're running away from something that's trying to eat you, they're actually quite common to get an injury like that and still survive it. So it can heal and then we can actually tell it was an injury and not just a broken bone. Awesome. Um, so Destiny would like to know, where do you usually find fossils? Uh, so you can find fossils all over the world. Um, and in many places in the world, you get a lot more than others. Um, Usually, nowadays, the easiest place, if you're going to go looking in your neighborhood for fossils, you would want to look around riverbeds because that cuts through many layers of rocks. So you can actually check all the different layers, uh, and then that way you can try to find something, if that's what you're looking for in your own neighborhood. Awesome. Um, so Leah would like to know, uh, and I don't know, this is a, a question, an awesome question, how big is dinosaur poop? <laughs> Uh, that's a really good question because if you think about let's let's think of some poop that we're more um, familiar with so like say you're walking down the street and you see dog poop you can see how it changes size because as soon as it starts to dehydrate 
it actually kind of shrinks and crumbles. So it's no longer the original size. So by the time dinosaur, fossil, uh, dinosaur poop fossilizes, it actually changes size a lot. So we can't really tell what the original size is. But I think it's pretty reasonable to assume that it was pretty big poop. That's awesome. Big, ginormous poop. Okay, uh, let's see. Ty, age 8, and Felix, age 11, both want to know, uh, what is the rarest dinosaur disease? Ooh, that's a good one. Uh, I think the rarest diseases are probably the ones, well, the rarest diseases that we can actually tell that they happened uh, would probably be cancers because they're, they're really hard to diagnose in an animal that's been dead for a long time. So it's probably cancers. Cool. Um, do you see like tumors on the bones? Yeah, absolutely. We can, um, especially like bone tumors. So like when, when the bone grows too much and then it's literally like a lump, on the bone, that's really easy to identify. But sometimes bone cancers can also eat away at the bone and it can be like a tumor made of cartilage and all kinds of soft tissue. That's harder to tell. Is there a hole in the bone because of cancer or is there a hole in the bone because of an infection? So that's kind of one of the, um, the problems that it comes to when diagnosing these things. Cool. Um, what's the oldest lived dinosaur, do you know? Like um, how long it lives or like oldest in time? Oh, great question. Uh, the individual that would be the oldest as a individual dinosaur, as opposed to like. Oh, I see. I, I don't actually know. Um, I know that some dinosaurs have been aged like upwards of 40 something years, if not more. Uh, and that's like um, the duckbill dinosaurs and, and some sarpods. So you can cut the bone and you can count the rings like you would in a tree and you can actually age a dinosaur that way. Um, but it's usually better if you can cut several bones, so then you can make sure that it's actually that age. Uh, but that doesn't happen very often because people don't want you cutting up their dinosaurs. Valid. Um, Leah would like to know, what is the uh, biggest dinosaur fossil? Oh, that's a good one and very relevant to my life right now. So we, so the biggest dinosaur fossil, single bone, you would think it'd be, it would belong to the biggest dinosaurs. So basically, if you think of the long neck dinosaurs, they actually have some really, really long limb elements. So you know how the longest bone in our body is our femur, our leg bone? The longest bone in their body was a humerus, so their arm bone from here to there. And we actually found one earlier this year, and I think it was like the sixth or seventh biggest one that was ever found in the world, and it's quite a bit taller than me. So that's one bone. You're trying to get out of a mountain that's taller than a human, and they're huge, absolutely huge. That's wild. Um... Let's see, Kelly would like to know, what's the most interesting disease that you've come across in, in fossils? That's a good question. Um, I, think, hmm, I think the most interesting diseases to me are usually the ones that are the most confusing. So it's like a love-hate relationship. At the beginning, I think it's one thing, and then I keep reading, and then realize it's something completely different. Um, so I think the most interesting diseases are the ones that we can get today, basically. So like things like metabolic disease, things that people live with today that ancient animals could get. So there's a lot of diseases that basically confuse your bones on how they're built. So they start building really fast and then slowing down and then resorbing and then building back up. And that confusion looks just as confusing as in a fossil, but it kind of shows that, yeah, they, they weren't that different. Their physiology was very similar to ours today. Super cool. Um, Sienna would like to know, uh, does dino poop have bones in it if it was a meat eater? Absolutely, and teeth too. Cool, awesome. Um, let's see, what's your favorite dinosaur and why from Tiffany, age 10? Uh, my favorite dinosaurs, hmm. uh, that's a hard one. I'm, I'm really falling in love with the big long neck dinosaurs. All sauropods are super cool. I'm, I'm a big fan of Camarasaurus. I think they have like a little bulldoggy face um, and they're really sweet looking, but big. And there's a ton of them. We actually found, found um, like baby ones. So you can go all over the US and you can see like baby ones mounted and they look funny because they have a big, big body and just tiny, tiny little head at the end of their necks. So I think they're really cute. That's adorable. Um, Let's see, Kaylee would like to know, uh, can you tell what type of parasites might have caused diseases in dinosaurs? Oh, that's a good one. So we're very reliant on what we know from modern animals. 
So ex for example, we know that there is this type of uh, protozoan that makes, um, that infects birds' jaws and leaves these holes in the jaws. So people think, okay, well, if birds can get this and birds' physiology is actually very similar to dinosaur physiology, then maybe some of the infections we're seeing in things like Tyrannosaurus and T-Rex and all the meat-eating dinosaurs, some of them get holes in the jaw too. So from that comparison, we think maybe something similar caused it. But can we actually find the, the um, parasite or can we actually find the virus? Not usually. We're usually just reading the bones. Cool. Um, do you have any scientific heroes? And if so, who or would they be? Uh, my scientific heroes, honestly, are all the scientists around today. Um, and I know everyone asks me that and expects me to say someone historic and, and big and that kind of thing. But I'm... I like to look at people that are going through the same struggles as me today. Uh, I think they're doing amazing, amazing things and we're living in a tough time and all the discoveries that are happening today are just as great as the ones before. So a lot of the modern scientists. Awesome answer. Um, Liam would like to know, I'm 14 and very interested in pursuing a career in archeology. span uh, Where would you start if you could go back and give any advice for someone in that position? So, Obviously, archaeology, just, I'm, I'm sure he, he knows, but no, I'm sure he knows, but I'm sure everyone else, maybe I should just tell him that, you know, archaeology is a little bit different than paleontology, but there's actually a, quite a bit of overlap, especially if you're studying mammals, which is kind of cool. Um, I would say uh, study as much as you can when it comes to like biology. And if there is, um, what's it called, like osteology in your university or your high school, or if there's anatomy, all of that, like, Anything that comes to anatomy, you should just get really familiar with it. Uh, and then read, read a whole lot because what you might be interested in now might change later on. And things are actually pretty easy to change in between when it comes to university. So I wouldn't put too much pressure on you, but just, you know, study a lot of biology and anatomy for now. Awesome. Um, Kimura would like to know, have any scientists found dinosaur DNA in mosquitoes? <laughs> Uh, no, that has not happened, actually. Not only not dinosaur DNA, but no DNA at all um, in mosquitoes or in any other fossils uh, that are older than about 15,000 years, I believe. Um, that might be a little bit different now. But yeah, we, when it comes to DNA chunks, uh, anything past basically the Ice Age, we don't get any. Uh, you can get some proteins, some collagens, but nothing like Jurassic Park. I'm sorry. sorry. Too bad. Wishful thinking. Um, Ava and Felix would like to know, is it true that chickens are closer to dinosaurs than other birds? Um, so that's a, that's a really good question, actually. So chickens and ducks um, belong to a very basal, what we call a basal group, meaning they're at the very bottom of the tree. So like if you think of um, all the animals evolving over time, there's a big spread and diversification. So what that really means is, okay, the groups at the bottom are more closely related to all the other animals that they came from. So ducks and chickens are actually pretty far down on that tree. So that would make them closer to dinosaurs than like say a hummingbird. Cool. Um, what is your favorite part and least favorite part about your job? <laughs> They're kind of the same thing, I guess. Um, <laughs> My favorite part is I get to travel a lot. I get to see a lot of things that I never thought I would see. I wasn't one of the people that thought they were going to be a paleontologist since they were seven years old. I was studying to be a doctor, like a medical doctor. Um, and after my life took a right turn, I guess, um, I've been just been getting to see all kinds of things. And I want to share it with everybody because there's so much behind closed doors in museums that most people don't get to see. Um, so that's my favorite part. On the same hand, having to travel a lot because that one fossil of that one animal is only in that one country. So you have to travel a lot, leave your family behind a ton, but it's, it's worth it right now. <laughs> so you're based in, in Berlin, Germany, but where do you go to travel for work? So uh, I'm all over because basically every museum, um, tends to have a lot of the fossils from its locality, from its area. So depending on what time you're looking at, depending on what animals you're looking for. So recently I just did a big trip across the UK and visited like several different museums. Uh, the summer before I was in the US. Um, it just depends on where the fossils are. That's where I have to go. So it depends. Cool. 
Um, so are there certain dinosaurs that you find end up with more diseases than others? Actually, yes. Um, so you have to also understand that like, we also find a lot more of a certain type of dinosaur than others. It's not like you find an equal number of stegosaurs and T-Rex and sauropods. And you, there are some that you find a lot more than others. So that already biases your sample. Um, so that means because you find a lot of one animal, maybe that's why we find a lot more diseases. So for example, um, duck-billed dinosaurs, the hadrosaurs, are riddled with injuries, disease, arthritis, um, all kinds of toothaches, tooth tumors. They have it all. Like if you're trying to find a disease in a dinosaur, you should go look at hadrosaurs because they're just covered. Man, poor hadrosaurs. Um, <laughs> so Rob, I love this question from Rob. Do you think that dinosaurs spread diseases through their roars like we spread them through sneezes? <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, I don't know. I don't, I can't, I can't say no, but I would think, first of all, there's not a whole lot of evidence that they actually did roar, not to break anyone's heart. No. Um, <laughs> but most animals actually don't vocalize that much and not right at each other's faces. Um, so if we're gonna say that, you know, like our, um, we're supposed to stay up about two meters away from each other, if we say the same thing applies for dinosaurs, then that means you have to roar at someone two meters away. And it seems at that point you might as well attack them. So I'm going to think that that's not completely applicable. I don't think so. Sounds good. Um, <laughs> let's see. How long does it usually take to find a fossil when you're out in the field? Oh, good, co good question. So it depends on the place and the density that the animals died in. So for example, if you're looking at a place that used to be a lake bed that dried up, so that concentrated all these animals over a long time, right at the base. So you can literally not take, in, in those places, you can't take a step without finding a fossil. In other places, you have to walk miles or miles or kilometers, depending on where you are, um, to actually find anything at all. So it completely depends on um, what the preservation of that area. Cool. Um, hmm. Generally speaking, like, okay, so we've talked about cancer, we've talked about bone breaks, we've talked about potential parasites. Um, what other things do you see evidence for in bones? So often we find um, infection. Infection's a really good one. So, and well, relatively, it's just, it's easy to diagnose because bone reacts really specifically to abscesses and infections. So it literally looks spiky. Sometimes it looks like it's pitted. Uh, and infections could happen from anything. They could happen from a break that didn't heal well. They could happen from scratch. They could happen from an animal falling on a stick and then it not healing properly. All kinds of things. So infections are actually really common as well. Uh, we see quite a bit of that. Um, awesome. So Reese, age nine, would like to know, do you use dinosaur eggs for researching diseases? Oh, that's a good question. Um, no, not yet. I don't think anyone's found anything that looked abnormal in uh, fossil eggs, as I know. Uh, I wish. That'd be good for Easter. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. If you were interested in uh, fossils, where do you think would be a good place to start to try to find some in your local uh, environment? Mm, that's a good one. Um, I would, again, I would start at rivers, usually, but I would also look up... Um, like geological maps. If you Google literally like fossils and say I, whatever city I live in or whatever neighborhood I live in, I bet you someone's gone out there and done a geological survey. And then if they say that this area is, you know, fossiliferous, that probably means it produces fossils. They might not be the fossils that you want though. They might end up just being, you know, um, teeth or they might be plants. Uh, and I would also urge everyone that is out there looking for fossils to make sure that they're actually allowed to collect the fossils um, on the land that they're on because depending what country you're in, depending what state or even sometimes it varies by region, um, some of the fossils are actually protected uh, or they're under um, like the native law depending on where you are. So just double check so nobody gets in trouble. It's a hot tip. Um, Leah would like to know what's your favorite place to travel? Uh, for fun? Let's say for fun. You can say for fun and for science. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, it works for both. I actually, I love to go home. So I'm Egyptian and I love to go back to Egypt for both. Um, there's quite a bit of 
um, fossils there when it comes to fossil whales. So I got to go see the Valley of the Whales a couple years back and I've been dying to go back since. Also the, the diving there is amazing. So living animals, fossil animals, you get it all. That's awesome. Um, let's see. What's the most dinosaur-like animal that's alive today? Birds. Always birds. Especially um, if, you, if you want to just look at the behavior and the craziness of like, oh, that's definitely a dinosaur. Go look at emus. Like just, just go down the rabbit hole that is YouTube emus. It's amazing. They are, they're dinosaurs. Yeah, cassowaries too. I look at those things and I'm like, <laughs> that's a dinosaur. Like, yeah, nothing with the blue faces is unbelievable. Right, and the crazy cask and the feet. Like the di dinosaur feet and bird feet are incredibly, incredibly similar. Like even down to the bones, um, they have the same number of like same metatarsals. It's just not as fused. Like they're they're really amazing. Very similar looking. Cool. Um, have you ever watched the documentary series Walking with Dinosaurs? And can you recommend any good dinosaur programs for a six or seven year old? Uh, I have, sh I'm ashamed to say I have not seen it. Um, as to good documentaries, um, honestly, I really like small short series that are on YouTube that are free. So I would uh, look up you should look up Jurassic Reimagined. That's the new um, documentary that uh, that's being made from the field work that I did last summer. That's really good. There's only the introduction on right now, but the other parts will be up soon. Uh, and then there's some smaller documentaries that are made by individuals that are really, really quite good um, on YouTube, but I can't think of a really good one right now that's like on Netflix or anything like that. I know um, the American Museum of Natural History in New York did a bunch of videos and they also recently had opened up maybe like a year ago a big t-rex exhibit so they were doing videos i think associated with that awesome. um yeah. i don't the remember if they would be like a little too high level for six and seven year old but you can go check it out their stuff is generally super accessible and, and good production value and all that awesome. um here's a question from harmony age 10 is it true that no one knows what color dinosaurs were <laughs> Um, yeah, honestly, when it goes down to basics, yeah, we really don't know what color they are. Even when we get amazing, amazing preservation, like um, some of the feathers and some of the beautiful, um, like flat dinosaurs that you get from China with where you can see striping. Yeah, you can tell that, okay, the animal is probably striped, but you don't really know, was that stripe black and that stripe brown? And that's because even though our technology is getting really good nowadays, and you can image melanosomes, the little cells that make melanin, you can actually image those in extinct animals. But you can't tell what they were expressing exactly. Some people thought they could re relate um, the shape of the cell with the color, excuse me, with the color, but that doesn't seem to actually relate that well. So that happens also when an animal dies, like if you've ever seen a fish that washed up on shore, they change color. So certain colors fade quicker or um, the cells die quicker. So we don't see them. And so then that actually brings up the question is, okay, well, if, it, if that color faded and those cells already died or disappeared or moved somewhere else in the body, and then it got fossilized, is that actually changing our perception of what color is? So the short answer is no, we actually have no idea, which kind of makes it fun because that means you can color your dinosaurs whatever color you want and you're not wrong. I love that. Um, Mackenzie would like to know, like, what's a day-to-day -day life in your job look like? Like, what do you, what do you do on a given day? Oh, you're not going to like me for saying this. Uh, I read. I read a lot. I'm in front of the computer a lot, a lot. Um, but yeah, I mean, even the coolest scientists who study lions, they're in, they end up in front of the computer a lot. And that's what happens because you have so much science that happened before you. There were so many amazing people before me that did so much work that I have to catch up on to kind of understand where we're at. So at least 30 to 40 percent of my day every day is just catching up on the history. Uh, but on really other good days, I get to spend in the lab uh, cutting up fossils, which is kind of cool. Awesome. Yeah. But once you cut up the fossils, like how are you looking at them? Uh, so Basically, okay, so let's say you have a fossil and then you cut it up 
and you glue one side basically to a slide, the same slide that your doctors would use or any other scientists would use, and then you cut off the rest. And then you grind it down till it's thin enough that you can shine light through it, basically. And then you put it under a microscope that shines light one way, and then there's a lens on the other side, and then you can see all the way down to cell structures uh, in fossils, depending on the preservation. So I basically use a microscope like everyone else, but just with very, very dead things. That's awesome. Um... All right, Amelia, age six, would like to know, could dinosaurs pick up any diseases from the foods that they ate, like the type of leaves that sauropods ate? Um, it's, it's actually quite difficult for any animal to get like a plant disease, if, if that kind of makes sense. So if you're thinking of a sauropod eating a plant and getting a disease that's specific to plants, that's actually quite not common. So like, you don't have to worry too much about catching tomato diseases, you know? Uh, we usually catch zoonotic diseases, so animal-based diseases that come from other animals. So if animals are sharing a pond where they're all drinking from the same pond, they can catch diseases that way. Cool. Um, the Ramos family would like to know, do you approve generally of the Jurassic Park series? <laughs> um, it's made a lot of more work for me, but at the same time, I feel like overall it does it does well for the community. It does well for curiosity. And if it makes several people just ask a few more questions and look up a few more things, then I think it's done its job. Um, is it accurate? No. Is it kind of funny? Yeah. Is it entertaining? Yeah. It's a movie. Like I absolutely approve of entertainment. So. Same. Anything that gets people interested that like science gateway drug, you know, I'm like, I'm exactly. Like, you know? Exactly. You won't find me policing like, Oh, you know, those, that's the wrong number of teeth on that. Whatever it was like, that's not the point. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so do you have, do you have any fossils like at home with you? I'm assuming you're home like the rest of us right now. I am. Um, let me see. I don't think it's anything that's like really pretty cause I haven't been out in the field here, but I have a skull. Let's do it. Uh, like, it's a it's a fox. It's not it's like modern. Hold on, wait. Let me see. I think all my fossils are upstairs. <laughs> it's so funny to me that almost everybody has more fossils in their home than I do. But I move around so much that I can't carry a bunch of rocks around. Rocks, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So this is a little fox skull that I found actually in my neighborhood. So this is one of the ways that I really got interested in science, just walking around and finding bones. Everyone thought I was really weird, but this is literally how you can study anatomy uh, in real life. And you start to look at how the bones interact and come together and basically like, like look how tight the sutures are to those lines. Each one of those bones was created individually, was actually developing individually and they meet perfectly together to make this perfect skull. And it's like amazing design. And I always wonder, I'm like, how did these cells talk to each other? And that kind of brings up a lot of my questions uh, in my research. Cool. And then this is not the prettiest fossil, but it's a clam. Nice. <laughs> all the fossils I have in the house are all cephalopod fossils, predictably. Uh, do you want to tell us about your uh, guess the skull game? Oh, sure. Okay. So for anyone watching and is on Twitter, uh, I run a weekly game basically called Guess the Skull. And this game was born of my innate curiosity of like, how does a fox face fit on something that looks like this? And just how weird animals look when you just strip it down to bones. Uh, and then that brings up the questions of, okay, well, I guess this shape is because they bite really hard. Or this shape is because they're trying to catch really fast things. And then that brings together the idea of morphology, which is the shape of things, uh, and function, and how things work. So that is literally our whole job. I, everyone thinks, oh, paleontology is really hard. How, do you, how can you figure this? But literally, this is it. You look at the shape of the thing, and you try to figure out how it works. And I'm basically, with this game, trying to get people to think, OK, I'm going to show you a weird-looking skull, and you're going to try to guess what animal it is. And if you do it week by week, I also um, do threads about what's really cool about the animal, so like uh, their teeth or why their skull is shaped the way it is or just how rare the animal is. And from that, you can go week by week. Oh, she told us last week that, you know, flat teeth mean it's a plant eater or pointy teeth mean it's a carnivore, you know, or something like that. So that builds up people's like osteological knowledge and it's a lot of fun. So just come by, give it a guess.
We can find tomorrow. you on Twitter at your first name, last name, right? Yep. Yeah, awesome. Haiti. Yep. Wonderful. Um, Nydia mentioned uh, the Land Before Time series. Did you watch those when you were a kid? Absolutely. In Arabic, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, every Christmas I would get one of those movies. Uh, and oh, I'll watch them awesome. How good is Ducky? Ducky is life. He's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it really brings me back. Um, did, did dinosaurs have ears? Absolutely, they did. Yep. So it, if you ever wonder if dinosaurs had blink, think of, this is, this is kind of how paleontologists also think. Not only do we have actual evidence in the bones that they had ears and ear canals, and we can even figure out exactly how, like, the shape of the ear canals are, but think of it this way. What, is the, what are the two things that are close? mostly related to dinosaurs, birds and alligators, right? So those are the two sides uh, that will kind of have dinosaurs in the middle. So birds have ears, they totally hear, and so do alligators. So it's very likely that dinosaurs had the same thing. Uh, but we, yeah, we totally have direct evidence and there are several people working on dinosaur um, hearing evolution because it actually changed through time because Although they came from an ancestor that was not exactly crocodilian, but something called archosaur, uh, archosaur morphs, um, they took their hearing systems in a different direction. So there's a whole bunch of people who, um, who study hearing in dinosaurs. Super cool. Um, this question was asked like a half hour ago, but it's a really good one. Um, how can you tell the difference between uh, when a bone was broken during the animal's life as opposed to like it breaking at some point after preservation? Yep. This is such a good answer, a good question, because this is what I, I tell people all the time. You know, how do you know that that bone didn't just break? But honestly, the animal has to heal a little bit for us to be able to tell that it was a, a break during the animal's life. So because if you just find two bones apart, like you said, it doesn't mean that the animal was injured in life. Uh, and if the animal breaks a bone and then dies right away, we're going to have to assume that basically that break happened after it died. Because if there's no evidence of healing, like the two bones coming together or any amount of resorption or anything like that, if there's no evidence of that, then we can't say that it happened during life. Cool. Um, Grayson, age eight, would like to know, what's the rarest dinosaur that people have found? Mm, the rarest dinosaur. Are there a lot of examples of dinosaurs that just like have one? Yeah, there's so, there's so many and their names are so obscure. Um, there's a lot of dinosaurs that are known from just one tooth or just one leg uh, or just a partial skull. The problem with that is that over the years, those uh, when, as, as we're finding more stuff, um, you start to find out, oh, that thing that we thought was the leg of some other animal and the face of that animal actually belonged to the same animal. Um, so that's kind of, that keeps changing. So I'm not going to give you a straight answer on that one. But uh, there's a lot of dinosaurs that are just known from chunks, small, small chunks. So that's why we need you all out there. I'll need to be looking for stuff. How can you tell if, like, you find a random bone that it, that, like, it doesn't go to a thing that you've already seen? Like, I feel like if you just found a leg bone, that's so impressive that you'd be able to know that it goes to from one thing or not. It's uh, this is a very controversial review or two question, but it's a, it's it's so true. Uh, it's basically like how do you know that that leg is not? It, why why would you call that a whole new species rather than it belonging to something else? And what people usually use are like what they think are speci special markers on a bone. So for example, this bone has a raised ridge on this one side that this animal totally doesn't have. So you have to make the argument, okay, we, this animal couldn't have had it throughout its whole life. It's not like this is just a baby and only the babies have it. So you have to make arguments like, okay, this shape is totally different than everything else we found. Um, however, it's, it's quite difficult because sometimes you'll find a whole animal, but without the back legs of it. And then you'll find back legs, but no whole animal. So are you gonna call these two different animals? Or are you gonna call, so. It just depends on, uh, we call them lumpers and splitters sometimes. Uh, so people who like to stay conservative and put them all in the same animal or people who are like, no, this is definitely a different animal. So it just depends on your school of thought. Fair. Uh, I feel like that must be really hard to do. Um, Luca, age eight, says he's uh, going to be a zoologist when he grows up. 
are there viruses that existed during the dinosaur times that still exist and can infect humans today? Ooh. Well, first of all, go be a zoologist. That's awesome. Uh, second of all, it's hard to tell like, because we don't have direct evidence of like, like you can't just split a rock and see, oh yeah, that's the virus, SARS, whatever. It doesn't work that way, right? So viruses don't preserve very well. Um, what we do see is what the viruses did to the bone or, or sometimes what viruses left in our DNA. So those are the only two ways we can look at viruses in the past. Now, if you're going to just talk about viruses, viruses actually mutate so quickly that they become something completely different in a few hundred years. So if you're thinking from the time of dinosaurs, it's probably unlikely. But could something related to something that existed back then be around today? Probably, since everything is related to an extent. But I wouldn't say the exact same virus or bacteria that existed back then is probably around today. It would be really hard to tell because they don't fossilize. Um, Julian, age nine, would like to know uh, how many of the dinosaurs flew? Oh, good question. Well, all the ones are almost all the ones that are around today. Uh, not all of them, but almost. Um, but actually quite, quite a few uh, flew. And then, yeah, and then even a bunch of extinct lineages of things that are pre-official birds basically flew. So yeah, their flight, flight happened um, quite a lot in late dinosaurs. Cool. Um, Dustin would like to know, what is the most underrated dinosaur in your opinion, and what is your favorite <laughs> dinosaur museum? Oh, my favorite dinosaur museum. Um, can I shout out my own museum right now? Totally. Yeah. Uh, I love, I actually love my museum, and that's not just because they pay my paycheck, but honestly, because of the dinosaur hall. So Museum for Naturkund, it's um, basically Natural History Museum in Berlin, and you walk in, and it's just a hallway of sauropods. And I think that's what started my love for sauropods because walking into work sometimes can be just, ooh. and then you see these animals that are gigantic staring at you like you're nothing. And you're trying to figure out their mysteries every morning. And you're like, fine, I'll go to work. And it's really inspiring. So I think that's one of the reasons I'm starting to really like sauropods and I love my museum, so. That's awesome. I've actually been to that museum. My dad and I yeah. went when he was visiting me in, in Berlin. That's awesome. Um, let's see, have you, Kimura would like to know, have you ever found Egyptian bones while digging for dinosaurs? For maybe at home or I don't know. Uh, Egyptian bones, no. Um, so I haven't, I haven't actually gotten to do any field work in Egypt, which is where you would find Egyptian bones. Um, but. I do know that um, my colleagues in Egypt have found all kinds of like human remains when they were um, on the way to certain sites. So it's very unlikely that you're gonna find human remains if you're digging in the right spot, but you might find them on the way because you're picking the layer of rock for the certain age that you wanna find things in. Um, and humans are much, much, much later. So you wouldn't exactly find things in the same layer. But if you're walking to your campsite or walking to whatever, they found human skulls, they found Roman artifacts in Egypt, because, you know, history. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, you can totally find it if you're digging in the right spot. If you're just walking in the desert, you'll find tons of stuff in Egypt specifically. Cool. Um, Nydia would like to know, what do dinosaur fossil locations all over the world have in common? Good question. So um, I'm going to change the question a little bit by saying good dinosaur locations. Um, so if you're trying to find like beautiful skeletons and like whole complete animals that just like will blow your mind, honestly, it's usually um, either like near riverbanks. So near ancient river, riverbanks, not like your local riverbanks today. So usually um, fossilization by like the depositing of sediment during a flood or during normal sediment movement in water gives you some really, really beautiful fossils. So it's usually some of the most beautiful areas in the world uh, are related to some sort of ancient waterway. So cool. that's usually what we look for. Um, Emily and Declan would like to know, how many dinosaurs do we know about right now? Oh God, so many, so, so many. Um, I'm not including birds, so many. Um, I don't have a num excuse me, I don't have a number for you. I'm sorry. But like definitely in the bananas numbers, like so many yeah. dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, like definitely over several thousand, I would say. 
cool. Um, awesome. So we try to keep these to be right about 45 minutes. So we have two final questions that we ask everybody um, in these sessions. The first is, what's one thing that you wish everybody knew about your area of expertise, like something that falls into your wheelhouse? And then what's something that you wish everybody in the world knew about literally anything? <laughs> um, okay, so we'll start with my own research. I really, really wish everybody knew that diseases can fossilize. So we have evidence for um, all kinds of diseases in the fossil record, which usually blows people's minds. So we have, I think the earliest record can of cancer is 250 million years old. So it's pretty old and people think that th those are very new diseases and, and they're not. They're just part of our biology throughout time. So that's something I really wish people would know about our field. Um, something I wish people knew in general, like about anything, um, how good birds are. Have you looked at birds? <laughs> <laughs> honestly, no, 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 but honestly, I, I just wish people knew more about birds because that's what got me into like diversity of life. Just realize that the sound that you're hearing isn't just the same bird. Like there's so much diversity in the world. And I guess that's what I'm talking about. Diversity of life. Same thing with fish, same thing with mammals. There's so much out there. And uh, yeah, I just wish people understood that we're a part of that, that we're a part of nature, not away from it. Right. What's your favorite living bird right now? Uh, it's called the bell bird and okay. it's the loudest bird in the world and you should Google it. Uh, it's, it's really weird looking. It sounds like a robot alien. It's awesome. Awesome. Where do they live? Uh, I think they're South American. Cool. Very cool. All right. Do you have anything else that you'd like to plug that you'd like us to know about? Uh, no, I just want everyone to stay curious, stay healthy and sane. Um, yeah, just read and it'll, it'll be over soon. And, uh, yeah, play guess the skull tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So we can find you on Twitter at uh, first name, last name, very easy. Yep. It's written right there. And then, uh, are you on Instagram as well? I am on Instagram. Same handle. Same handle. Beautiful. Um, awesome. So that's, we should definitely be following you if you aren't already. Um, sweet. So thank you for joining us today on Skype a Scientist Live. Thank you, Erin, for signing for us as always. Um, let's see. Tomorrow, like I mentioned at the top, we have four sessions tomorrow because it's the uh, one week until Earth Day, and so Skype a Scientist is partnering up with Earth Day Network, and we're bringing a bunch of uh, green-themed uh, sessions. The first is going to be at 11 a.m. Eastern on plastic pollution, and then at noon, we have one on climate change. At 3.30 p.m. Eastern, we have one on biodiversity, specifically in islands. And then at 4.30, we're going to be hearing from the Earth Network folks that work with uh, that group all about um, things that we can do for Earth Day, even though we're stuck inside, um, and just things to think about, history of Earth Day, all that kind of stuff. So we hope to see you there. Um, as always, please support us if you can. We're totally donor supported. You can do that at patreon.com slash Skype a Scientist or paypal.me slash Skype a Scientist. Um, every little bit really helps. We're mo all completely funded uh, by small donors. So we really appreciate uh, your support. All right. Thanks again, Yara. Thank you, Erin. We'll see you tomorrow. You're absolutely welcome. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Jeez, now my thing freezes. Okay, there we go.